Hi, good evening everybody. I'm Paul Johnson, uh, here representing the South Wales and West of England branch. Um, and tonight uh, I'm pleased to introduce, as part of our fifth branch webinar event, James Silles. Uh, and he's going to be talking around the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor Project. Okay. Um, before we get into the, the main body of the presentation, just got a little bit of housekeeping to go through. Um, attendees will be getting evaluation sheets, so please do uh, best endeavours to fill them in so you can let us know thoughts about the event and also what you'd like to see in the future as well. So that's really important. Um, looking at tonight's event, um, if you do have any questions, please do submit them via the chat function on the site. Uh, our host, Rob Allen, will then um, ask James these questions in the Q&A session. Okay. In terms of uh, APM updates, the APM board has decided there's not going to be any more physical events until June of this year. Obviously, with a planned COVID vaccine rollout, uh, we're hoping this will, will be really achievable. Uh, however, we're going to continue in the meantime with lunchtime and also evening webinars such as this one. Uh, while we can't meet physically, um, I would like to just remind everybody there are excellent resources on the APM website. Uh, this includes a lot of APM learning, um, APM project management modules, and also supporting resources to help you develop knowledge and skills where you can't have those networking opportunities uh, at evening events. Um, specifically, uh, looking at Chartered as well, uh, there's a lot of guidance documents uh, available on the website, and we've now got over 1,500 um, Chartered Project Professionals uh, within the APM, which is a fantastic achievement. Uh, again, we're putting on a lot of webinars uh, to assist members with preparing for Chartered Project Professional. So if that is something that interests you, please, please go to the website as your first port of call. Looking ahead into the future um, for the next lot of webinars that we'll be putting on, um, I think we're looking for the 8th of March. We're going to have a collaboration event um, using Rolls-Royce. 18th of March, um, there's a value management um, event, which is the Benefits and Value Special Interest Group. 24th of March, uh, we're running an event on procuring for collaboration on projects uh, with Cosk and Procurement SIG. 6th of April, uh, again, date to be confirmed. Uh, I am closing in on this one. Uh, we'll be Atkins Naira Chamberlain uh, doing a, a webinar on data analytics, big data, and the ethics behind using them uh, around artificial intelligence and machine learning. 22nd of April, uh, we're looking to do an event on asset management. Uh, and then finally, I'll highlight that the 6th of May is the PM Challenge finals night. Um, so again, the branch has run um, the challenge, I think, for the seventh successive year. Um, obviously, with, notwithstanding the COVID impact, uh, we still have eight teams that have entered, uh, looking at putting on virtual, uh, virtual events for their charities of their choice. Um, so that'll be a really exciting evening and uh, yeah, one I'll be participating in as a judge. Uh, we'll be continuing to host webinar events for members until we're able to host physical events. Because uh, obviously I think you know, I'm really missing meeting the members, the networking and of course the, uh, the buffet as well. Okay, that's all for me in terms of housekeeping. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, James Sillers. Uh, he's a senior project manager from Atkins. Like I said, he's going to be talking around the international thermal nuclear experimental reactor which is a very complex project. Um, so thank you for listening. I'll now hand over to James for the presentation. Thanks, Paul, for the introduction. Well, good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to this presentation about ITER and the organizational and technical challenges of delivery. I'd normally start a presentation by asking who's actually heard of ITER? Um, I don't think it'll work in this forum, so uh, I'll assume not a lot. I'm always surprised every time I give a presentation on this project, how few people have actually heard of what's happening down here at the south of France. So I'm always pleased to take an opportunity to, to update those do, who do know and to, to introduce people to, to what is a, a bit of an unknown mega project that the UK is very much contributing to. So this photo is of the ITER site from about two years ago. Currently, it's a construction site, as you can see, in the south of France, just north of Marseille on the south coast. And at the centre of the site, um, just where you can see the tower crane coming from within it, is a round element, 
this is this will house what is essentially a giant thermos flask which will hold a vacuum at minus 269 degrees C inside which will be a fusion machine known as a tokamak within which will be a burning plasma at 150 million degrees C and that when operating will be the hottest place in our solar system. This talk is about two of the biggest challenges to manage what is essentially the largest R&D project in the world, about the organisational and the technical. This session is split into three parts with time for questions afterwards. I'll start with an overview of ITA, the background, what it is, what are we trying to achieve? And the second will be on the organisational challenges of mega projects. And the third will be on managing the technical complexity on ITA. On the introductory slide, we saw from above the circular home of the tokamak. And I wanted to share this Star Trek-esque internal view with you. This is mid-lowering the base of the cryostat, which will house the tokamak. It will house it in a vacuum one million times less dense than air, and it ensures that the supercooled magnets are cooled to their four degrees Kelvin. It's a 1,250 tonne component, which is equivalent to about four fully loaded jumbo jets, 30 meters in diameter. This vessel is, is staggering. It will house a temperature differential of minus 269 degrees C, and 150 million degrees C, just three meters apart, all inside that. So what is ITER? So ITER stands for the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. It's the largest fusion machine ever built, and it was envisaged in, in the 1980s with discussions between the UK, France, Russia, and the US developing fusion energy for peaceful purposes. The overall value is about 20 billion euros, and it's one of the most challenging and innovative science and engineering projects in the world today. The main aim is a test bed for the key technologies and to validate the Q greater than 10, which is the ratio of fusion power to input power. The current record for, for Q is from JET, the Joint European Taurus, Taurus reactor, which is, is situated just outside Oxford in the UK, of approximately 0.67. ITER is designed to produce 500 megawatts of fusion power from 50 megawatts of injected thermal power. Okay. Some of the key technologies inside in, include the heating, control, diagnostics, remote maintenance and handling, which allows the study of this burning plasma. I won't go into too much detail on the science of fusion today. Um, that's for a, another presentation, I think. Um, but if anyone is interested, then, then please feel free to contact myself or ask a question at the end. Um, there's a few slides I'll, uh, I've got, but I'll, I'll skip through today just, uh, just so we can focus more on the organizational and technical challenges. So who is involved? So I, IO, its organization, is an intergovernmental organization that was created by an international agreement signed in 2006 called the ITER agreement. It's made off of seven domestic agencies, the European Union, India, Japan, South Korea, Russia, China, and the US. Yep, you did hear me right. You've got Russia, China, US, India, and the EU and Japan all working together to, do, to basically prove the concept of fusion power for peaceful purposes. ITER organizations responsible for supervising the plant, design, construction, product integration, installation, operational and decommissioning. So that's the plant at the tokamak itself. The domestic agencies, they all provide an in-kind benefit through key fusion technology areas. So they share the cost of the project and the device by value, not currency. For example, where India provides all the cooling water pipe work, Russia supplies the actual tokamak housing itself, and then a number of the other countries supplied bespoke technology. 
Fusion for Energy, F4E, which is the European domestic agency, is responsible for the buildings, the infrastructure, power supplies, and is the largest contributor by capital money, um, purely by the fact that it's built in Europe and it is the country that is benefiting. It's this the uh, agency which is benefiting the most from it being where it is. So the wider site, to give you an idea of the scale, it's a 42 hectare main site with, a, with about 40, approximately 40 buildings across the site, which includes the 50 by 200 meter tokamak complex shown in red in the center of the scheme. To get an idea of the scale, the assembly building is 60 meters high and has a footprint of over 6,000 meters squared. The hot cell at the north, which has not yet commenced construction, is going to be there after the operational for the maintenance and decommissioning of the plant. It includes significant remote handling systems and is over five storeys tall. The cryo plant, sorry, the cooling water plant, um, this plant supplies a flow of over 33 meter cube per second. It has a chilled water system, a, a bespoke tokamak cooling system, and also a heat rejection system. You can, you can see some of the fans that are actually a part of the, the heat rejection system. And it supplies all of the buildings and plants. The cryo plant is, supplies the, the cryogenic equipment. So the liquid helium and liquid nitrogen and is the largest concentrated cryo plant ever built in the world. The control building in purple, that's for the diagnostics and control, access, data, communications, and it's the, the end point of over 10,000 kilometers of cables, which uh, control all of the plant and systems. The fabrication and cryostat buildings, so these are two temporary buildings. They were built purely for the components that were too large to be manufactured off-site and uh, had to be manufactured actually on the ITER site. The radio frequency heating building, the light, light blue on the, uh, on the west, sorry, east if we're looking, of the um, assembly building. This supplies two of the three methods for heating the plasma. Uh, which are basically radio waves at different frequencies. So in essence, it's a, it's a giant microwave. The electrical systems and power. So we have both um, direct current for the, the plasma operations, which is uh, the, the two buildings in the center. And then we also have alternate current for the industrial auxiliaries. The auxiliary site service buildings, so they supply all the gas networks, liquid networks, hot water, potable water, compressed air, uh, industrial sanitary drainage um, to all of the all of the buildings. And then in, interconnecting all of those, we have the site-wide infrastructure of galleries, tunnels, fire water, drainage networks, earthing grids, special foundations, cooling water networks, finishing with the lighting, road security, etc. So the organization on the site, I work for Atkins uh, in the UK and I am seconded into a entity called Engage, um, which is a, and Atkins is a, is a partner, uh, a stakeholder in the architect engineering contract, which is Engage. Engage is responsible for the delivery of the buildings, um, the over the 40 buildings, the infrastructure and power supply. This to date has included nearly 4 million hours of work to date. Engage takes the responsibility for the delivery and coordination, the design, site supervision, planning, integration, quality, nuclear safety, health and safety and environment plus contract management. Engage is the main link from the contractors to the client, which is Fusion for Energy, the European domestic agency, and then to the, the end user, which is the ITER organization, IO. And there's multiple stakeholders involved in day-to-day -day activities from multiple um, cultural backgrounds. So my role, I'm the building delivery leader for the site infrastructure. 
uh, in basically French for project manager. I'm accountable for the delivery of the works on site, including the construction management, planning, coordination, integration of design, interface management, and leading all of the engaged infrastructure activities. I have a team of about 11 full-time engineers supporting my role and access to over 150 engineers and technical experts who work directly for Engage. The infrastructure contract is a consortium of three French contractors, SB, Valerian and Atelier de Fosse. The contract value is in the region of 120 million euros and with a six year con construction duration. I started working he out here in 2016 and to date with TB16, the, the, sorry, the um, infrastructure contractor, we've completed over two kilometers of the 10 meter deep drainage networks, five kilometers of the safety related electric galleries, over eight kilometers of cooling water pipe work and nearly 30 kilometers of supporting networks. And we're still going. The final surface works, roads, fences, lighting, etc., is due to be completed in 2022. And we're driving towards the project key milestone or first plasma in 2025. So enough on the background, let's get in. So in the introduction, I said I was going to talk about the technical and organizational challenges. This is very bizarre, not having any feedback from anyone in the crowd, but I'll, I'll do my best and hopefully you are all following. And um, yeah, please do, do raise any questions in the chat or tell me if I'm going too fast or anything like that. Um, so the, te the technical and organization challenges of delivering the largest R&D project in the world. So on the slide, you'll see some of the generic challenges from project delivery, very recognizable, not just to a mega project, but you see them on numerous projects, high cost, demanding schedule, technologic, technologically and logistically challenging, requires multidisciplinary inputs from many organizations, management of numerous concurrent and complex activities, high level of public or political interest, um, good one. and high levels of uncertainty due to uniqueness. There are also challenges that come to projects as they move forward into delivery. Again, these are likely to be familiar to you. So poor execution, um, incomplete design, lack of clear scope, shortcuts, um, errors, mistakes, um, lack of vision, justification, real need that drives through the project, insufficient planning, inability to find, use, right capabilities, and lack of controls for risk or schedule management. But when it goes right, and you have all those things managed, it's fantastic. Strong culture, people make change happen. So collaborative, innovative, flexible process, you know, I understand the opportunities to risk and simplify, share lessons learned, consider it necessary. Well-managed change, good PM practices, strong culture. We see change in behaviors as a willingness to do better when you have the strong culture, whether it's in safety or schedule, a common purpose and perception of higher risk reward changes, the perception of what can be achieved. I can, I can talk a lot about what it should look like and what it does look like, but what I'll go into is the reality and my experience of, of ITA. So applying that to the complexity of ITA, it has the same challenges as some of the other projects, the demanding schedule, political interest, budget concerns, but its unique and overall driving factor is the research and development part. With global inputs, so the input data arriving during the delivery stage, impacting the engineering design and construction. To date, they still haven't found or de developed some of the materials they need to use within the tokamak. And I'm gonna talk about the two particular elements. So the organization, multicultural, multi-organizational, 
stakeholder engagement and the overall coordination of that. Then how you address these to the huge technical challenges in these contexts. These manifest themselves in different ways, but they all relate to technical complexity. The change management, engineering challenges, construction challenges and coactivity and interfaces. So the organizational size. So of course, expecting everyone will sit around the table neatly is not appreciating the different ways, different cultures engage. Building relationships, this can look very different in different cultures. The seven points, the key points shown here are the key, key principles of stakeholder engagement. I think most people will recognize them. You identify, you seek to understand, relate, plan and prepare, communicate in appropriate way, consult early and often, encourage participation and you build that relationship. I think we all, all agree on those. But cultural different, cultural engagement is slightly different and I want to, to go into the key principles of that. Um, as we go through the list you'll see we start more organisational and then become more individual specific. Um, we used to doing this in our own cultures, uh, the UK for example, and in different companies. I know how Atkins culture works and I know how I fit within it. Same within different sectors, a lot of us work in the nuclear sector. It's uh, open to challenge, it's very culturally uh, open, um, but there's preconceived ideas about speaking to different groups of people that come from our culture. And the same applies here in ITER, but it needs more thought because we're not familiar of the differences from other people's culture. So first, the, the importance of project culture. The project culture should overcome other cultural differences if it's strong enough. So despite ITER having over 30 nationalities and languages, the common goal is driving people forward. First Plasma 2025. We see it everywhere. Everyone knows the date, everyone knows what we're trying to achieve. However, that not to say it doesn't come without challenges. Be aware of typical areas of differences. Do not stereotype. For example, individual versus group speak. Speaking up in meetings before and after. That's incredibly French. Normally, most agreements in France are happened around the, the coffee machine after the meeting, but that doesn't work with other cultures. Challenging your seniors, you don't disagree with your boss if you're from China or India or even from France. There's no open to challenge. Self team promotion, people's deems of success are very much I rather than we. And ex even to the extent of, of asking about people's personal lives, what you can and can't do in different cultures. Some people are open to talking about who they are and their issues. Some people are very closed and you won't change it. But turning that around, respecting and understanding and appreciate the different ways of working. So you're understanding the different ways of working and using it to your project's advantage. I'm not just talking about the Spanish siesta, but different approaches to thinking about risks or how to define requirements. Some of this is cultural, but some of this, uh, some is just that any group of people bring difference of knowledge, looking at a problem for a different way, from a different perception, from a different way it's been solved before. Different experience and from a stakeholder point of view as well of course how to engage with clients is different in different cultures ways of engaging and the, the main bit is to try and harness all the different parts from the different culture and how you can apply that to your project and your team at it uh, i find um, one example that i always use an example is uh, a detailed design package for example uh, a french colleague of mine uh, his from his culture, a, a detailed design, 
is not as detailed, for example, as a Spanish cultural, uh, Spanish friend of mine. So someone in my team will produce a, what they think is a sufficient report as a, as a detailed design. He will hand it to another member of the team to review, who will say, this is, this is only just barely a concept, but you have to work in having the right culture. And we go back to item one of having the project culture overriding those different cultural differences but you have to look to harness it and where the people best sit so that takes you on to four recognize the individuals be aware of people and empathy for who they are appreciate their needs difference in culture is often influenced by values empower them people might be finding things difficult in different cultures i.e. the British well done from your boss doesn't exist in a French culture. So don't expect people to change, but appreciate people. This takes preparation, personal mindset, managing your own expectations of what people can achieve and set up mini projects appropriately with the right team members and be clear on objectives and activities in a way that allows others to find their own preferred routes. I use a couple of examples here around site facing roles, uh, emergency crisis management roles. Some cultures are not uh, endemic to that. And I always like to use the, the example, which very much annoys my French colleagues, that uh, British management with French engineering generally gets good results. I was gonna say something about language, but uh, uh, it does help but it's not uh, not so much in a project management com uh, context. I think uh, speaking the same language, if it's engineering, generally engineers are, are very good and project managers are very good at speaking the same language. Um, but it is renowned that the British are by far the worst linguists, I think, in the world. Uh, there's multiple times where you're sat in a meeting with um, with numerous others, say 20, and uh, you're the only English guy in the meeting, yet all the meeting speaks English for you. So switching to how to manage technical complexity. So we've just talked about some of the multicultural differences and, and how they're applied. But how do you apply that to technical complexity? First, the organization. Um, engage people in making things simple. Complexity is not being more sophisticated or more clever. Um, avoiding duplicated priorities and management structures. One project team. Clear roles and responsibilities are required with simple lines of communication. Um, and I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to have the right profiles, skills and expertise in each role. Planning. Break it down into achievable goals. It can be something as complex as constructing a, a cryostat base, but it can be achievable if you broke it down. Don't eat the elephant all at once, is the famous saying. The governance and performance. Know how you're going to track progress. This means, again, really breaking things down into clear steps. Make it manageable and tangible. I tend to think if I cannot explain a goal to my wife, then how am I going to explain it to a, a foreign client? Um, it's not simple enough. Understanding information transfer. Who does what? How do they interact? What information needs do they have? Take time to think this through and get it written down on paper. And it's okay to say, I don't know and I don't understand. Be open and honest to manage expectations and needs. This will sound quite familiar, I hope, to a number of you, but it's as applicable on technically complex projects as it is to any normal PM project. So applying this more widely, so how do we apply this? There are many concepts out there regarding managing change, etc. You would have seen, probably read books, been to other presentations, and they all tend to follow similar themes. And there's not one that's perfect, there's not one that's completely right. Um, but I found at ITER that the, the eight-step change model by John Cotter is the most applicable and relevant. It breaks things down into three phases, 
keeping things as, as simple as you can. Um, the, it's, for, for, for me, I find it works because um, the elements of complexity and the issues that create the challenge can be hard to define until the end. And even then, you find the project team you get to step three, the um, stage three, implementing and sustaining the change. And we're staying there. We're building on the change. So let's go through. So the first three, three steps, understand what is creating the complexity, uh, complexity and what is important. So creating this climate for change is where you should take your time to understand. Understand who the stakeholders are and engage them and then work together to agree desired outcomes and how best to break down the complexity. Again, I go back, take your time to understand this stage and don't get distracted by people who aren't part of solving the issues. The noise is enormous on mega projects. Learn how to cut through it and who the real stakeholders are and who you need to have on side. So step two, enabling the change. Define and communicate roles, responsibilities, and the planned actions. They're very similar to what we discussed before. Ensure that action happens. Continually review steps one and two. So make sure it's happening. Show progress. Planning needs to allow this. Acknowledge success. My key thing for this is, is working together. That's the, the main part, overcoming the differences and making sure that actions are, are going forwards. Step three, implementing and sustaining the change. Use the success of to reach further, allow development, review and report the impacts on overall objectives. Now I'm gonna be honest, I only ever use reach um, seven. Um, and the big thing here for me is, is really celebrate successes. However little, however small, you get, uh, you get something completed, you get a, a problem solved, you get a stakeholder bought in, you get something signed off. Um, celebrate that with your team. Uh, there's nothing better to build a team dynamic in environment but than, than celebrating together. And again, cultural differences bring how you celebrate in, into fact. There's a lot of different ways, but uh, we tend to find on the teams here that we, we take it in turns on, on different cultural uh, activities, when you can, of course, due to COVID, um, to celebrate those changes. Uh, so the future. The schedule in ITER is now reached a construction testing commissioning phase. Um, it's the most highly complex phase and the machine assembly has started. Here's a, a fantastic picture of the installation of the, the lower cryostat base into the, um, uh, so it's the lower thermal shield, sorry, into the cryostat base. First plasma is scheduled for 2025. That's when the, the first plasma will actually be within that machine. And the journey to commercial fusion power continues with the idea of a demo in Japan which is aiming to prove a concept of Q equal to 25 and at a consistent basis, tritium fueled self-sufficiency and will actually produce electricity. ITER is proving the concept and then DEMO will approve the viability and the, be the blueprint for future commercial reactors. All right. No, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for everyone um, for listening. Uh, apologies, it's a bit of a, a strange, uh, a strange way to um, attend a attend a presentation. Um, apologies, I can't be there with you to to get the feedback. But I hope uh, hope you found it interesting and useful. And uh, I'm open to any questions or further comments people might have. Excellent. Thank you, James. That's a, a fascinating presentation and. Um, I can see the comments coming in and the questions as well. And everyone's saying, yeah, great points. Uh, thank you for sharing. So I'll, I'll start with that. So thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll work my way through the questions. Uh, Catherine's uh, posed the question, when will it actually be finished? 
Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. So there, there's a famous saying that fusion's always 40 years away. And uh, I like to think that it's not um, a hitter. We, we've got a very defined milestone of, of first plasma in 2025. And the idea is within 10 years of first plasma um, to actually have a fully fueled sustaining plasma. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, I, I had a question myself, but I think Emma's actually summed it up quite nicely. I know you mentioned that you moved over to France in 2016 and, and you had a good slide about the um, stakeholder engagement. Um, Emma's question is, was the need to establish a strong project culture arrived over time or consciously applied from the start? Um. I'm going to, within, it was definitely uh, arrived over time. Um, when I first came to the project, there was a lot of conflict on the project. There was a lot of um, different stakeholders with different um, drivers, targets, conflicting um, needs, um, which, which over the, the five years I've been here, within the, the first year was very much driven into a common goal. And they did that through developing what's called the common assembly sequence. So this is the, the one, the, what they call the, the straight road to first plasma. And they, they, they drew that up and they got all of the different stakeholders, the, the, the fusion for energy responsible for the buildings, all of the domestic agencies responsible for the plant and equipment to sign up for this straight road to first plasma and to commit to the, the 2025 date. And then it all came about achieving that, that straight road. It all came about how do you make sure that you're not on that critical path? How do you make sure you're not blocking anyone who's on that critical path and uh, achieving the, uh, the, the, the 2025 first plasma date? Excellent, thank you, James. Uh I'm sure that helps with Emma and it certainly helped with my question around that as well. Um, Nick has asked, who possesses the capability to design a tokamak? Um, so the, the technology at ITER, it's actually a, a Russian technology. Um, the way ITER works and, and what makes it so fantastic is everything is basically open, open source to the founding members. So Russia's tokamak technology was basically benefited as a benefit in kind to the project as the Russian contribution. So they said, this is our technology. We've proven it to, to this point. We now need the scale of ITER to make it prove um, as a viable commercial reactor but we can't afford to do it ourselves and we need some of your technology to help us as well. So they then, they benefited their technology to the project and then other countries around the world have done the same. And it's, uh, it's what makes the project so fascinating that even in this world of intergovernment arguments and whatnot, that if through the science community, everyone really is open to this idea of, you know what, let's give Fusion a goal, um, a go. You know, I, one of my um, my colleagues who works uh, works for in the actual uh, research and development side of ITER summed it up as how could you look at your children in the eyes in in say 40 years time and they say well you had the capability to to develop a fusion reactor why didn't you do it and you say well well this project is it's trying it we're, we're going to give it a go if it works fantastic we've we've come up with an energy source that's almost limitless and uh and if we can prove the commercial viability then uh, it's an amazing achievement thank you james thanks for sharing it's actually you, you showed showed a great slide i think it's number two or three about the different countries working together um and bringing the different skill sets and yeah fingers crossed for a positive outcome so tim uh, is alluding to one of your your statements and he said james great model for change what is the best change example you have seen at ITA, and how did the french context impact it and then he shared that he's uh, led a team and a project at la Verre near marseille and learned a lot about working in france in french yeah no it's it's, it's a good question i i think the, the best way so we've 
we've had a lot of challenges on on it uh, in terms of having um, design validation due to, to late input data or undefined requirements and, and things like that. And I think one of the the the, the, the best ways I've had with um, getting a team and, and especially the cultural differences to work together is is understanding each team member's personal drive and goal of what they want to achieve um, and especially the French because they they don't tend to do that very well in France you tend to get onto a development path which is very rigid and structured within within a company and it's not necessarily what you want to do as a personal goal so understanding the personal drivers of your team and what they want to achieve personally from their careers or that part of the project or even that task or the design task you need to do, getting them aligned to it and getting them to, to, to learn and uh, yeah, develop in that role really brings the, the best out of people and gets them fully committed to achieving the task. Excellent. Thank you, James. And um, people responding saying thank you very much for your answers along the way. Um, Andrew has said very impressive. Thank you. Um, Michael has said very insightful. And just to let everyone know, James is kindly allowing us to recall today's session. And this will be made available on APM YouTube, um, along with all the other webinars that we've held recently. Um, Phil has kind of picked up on one of your previous answers about a change manager. And he's wondering if there's a dedicated change manager within the team. No, there's not. There's not. We, we, we. Um, there probably should be. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, Engage as an organisation is in a, um, a period of transition at the moment. So, I, I, I deliver the site infrastructure, and I have a specific um, goal. To, to to deliver that contract you know on, on time on budget etc cetera, etc cetera. engage who i work for who is the architect engineer responsible for the delivery of the site wide buildings infrastructure networks etc is actually changing at the moment to go from a design led entity site delivery led entity to a testing and commissioning led entity and it's it's one of the items that I'm finding quite interesting at the moment is I'm sitting slightly outside of that delivering my scope, but watching the business change in how it's looking to interact with um, with the it organization in in the testing and commissioning side, um, yeah, they, they should really be following key change management processes, um, which is a, is a, I think a topic for a, a beer to discuss how that should be applied in a French organization without getting yourself kicked off the project. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, Phil, I, I hope that helps. Um, so Hugo, Hugo's asked a really good question about the people and he says, it sounds like you're saying treat everyone as an individual rather than it's multicultural. Can you expand on this at all? Um, yeah, so it is, and I think that's the, the the basis of how I find the multicultural working is you've got to understand the original, the the individual and their their culture. Um, what you tend to find, and this is my experience of it, so I, apologies if I'm, I'm globalizing a bit, is the people that come to work abroad are coming to experience different cultures and ways of working. So they bring with them their culture which they've their their working culture and they they're looking to to understand yours and benefit from yours and then take that back home on what works and doesn't work so when you understand the the individual and what their drivers are and what their cultures are you sort of learn how you can fit that into your team um, some cultures are, are very deeply in ingrained and you'll never change and you have to learn how to harness them uh, whereas others are, are very open. Um, I, I tend to find some of the 
the most open people are, are people like the Greeks and the people that are coming from um, far-fetched parts of Europe that are, are really open to change, whereas some that are very regimented, uh, things like the, the, the Germans, are, you know, we've always done it that way, that way works. Yet when you come here, you have to learn how to work with those people and harness their skills. Um, so it, it is about the individual very much so. And, and yourself as an individual, would you say that you've taken certain elements from different cultures and, and, and what element would you say has, um, I don't know, improved you as a project manager? I'd say my level of English has, has reduced massively in five years. I've, I've learned how to drum down my communication. That's one, one part that you learn very quickly is you talk slowly and you talk clearly. Um, and I think that's one thing that a very simple message, incredibly simple, but if you take that back as a, as a cultural thing, don't expect everyone to have understood you. I made that mistake very early on going into meetings, speaking like I would have if I was in the UK. I assumed it was a, a, an English speaking project. Everyone spoke English, but people don't always understand what you're saying. So talk, talk slowly, talk clearly and always make sure that you're recapping at the end the actions and the, and people are understanding exactly what they need to deliver and and just yeah think the sim simple things like that, that that come from working on multicultural projects are one of my biggest take homes yeah the, the power of language and clarification and confirmation for sure um marius has, has asked a good question and he says first thank you for the insight james with such a relatively long program do you find less of a sense of urgency from non-critical path elements of the project? And do you experience some challenges in maintaining contractors delivering these elements? Uh, the answer is yes, very much so. The, uh, um, I, I'm gonna again give sort of my example here is, um, the, every, everyone knows the critical path everyone knows um, what's needed to deliver the critical path and it can be all encompassing where all of the say the management senior leaders decision makers are focusing on that um, however ITA likes to say that it's not a, a French project it still is a French project and one of the biggest cultural things you'll find in France and I think one of your colleagues who'd worked in France had one of the guys had said he worked in France would have found is, is you don't disagree with your boss and you, your boss is always right. And the problem is, is there's only so many bosses here that actually are empowered with budget and change um, capabilities. I'm quite lucky in my scope that I have that, but in, in for the critical path, if you're off that critical path and you're trying to get something done, that doesn't impact it, trying to get your, um, just your budget requirements or anything through an approval process is very, very difficult and long. And you have to very much be uh, persevere to make sure that it doesn't get completely forgotten. And uh, I, yeah, so the, the answer to that is, is very much so. It's, a, it's one of the biggest challenges here. Um, and in the slide I'm showing now, you can see the building on, actually just on the left of the tokamak, that building was stopped to allow the tokamak to be finished on time. So a whole building, building 14, which is houses the Trissum Felicidities, was just plain stopped because the focus was on finishing the tokamak on time for assembly. So they hit the milestone, which was fantastic for the start of assembly. Now they're having to restart the building and realizing all of the challenges of constructing a building whilst doing the assembly is a lot more difficult. But uh, it, yeah, the, the, the program does blur um, what would necessarily be a sensible decision. Excellent. Thank you, and Marius, I, I hope that answers your question. Um, so Thomas has asked, and, and perhaps linked to some of our previous conversations about international working, um, how do you plan and schedule such a large R&D project? Is it mostly using agile, waterfall, or a mix of the both? Or are then add are these actually terminologies that other international countries know no so the, the agile what you, you can apply those on le, local little um sort of project teams type delivery side but on the global project no it's 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 very much a, 
a very structured, large um, program. And then you've got to, then you've, as I said in my slides, you've got to break that down into the deliverable chunks. And then you've got to apply what works with those chunks. So I think by nature, here we very much apply an agile sort of project management system well i i know i know i do in terms of you can't you can't do the regimented project management here it just wouldn't work um you have you have to you have to sort of work with um the the people and the teams that you have available and you sort of structure and mold them into how you work and how you deliver and you get them empowered in the success of delivery and then they get hungry for it and and then you sort of build up this this culture of delivery um, but I wouldn't say you apply a specific model I think it um, it, it comes from um, who you who and what you're delivering and what you need to do to deliver that. Excellent. Thank you for the explanation. Um, there's a great comment here from Sarah. Um, Sarah says, my 12 year old has enjoyed the presentation <laughs> and then said, and, point, and pointed out that she's younger than the project. Uh, and your explanation was at the right level of complexity for all us watching. So Sarah and her daughter uh, or child really enjoyed it. So thank you for that. Um, Matthew has asked, have you benchmarked against any similar projects and Matthew shared that he works for HPC and they have had a very similar experience. Um, benchmark in terms of program or, or, or cost or in terms of the the technical complexity and delivery I guess I, I'll go I'll go on that angle perhaps. Um, yeah I have um, I have from my side I'm, I'm very lucky in the Atkins space that we have numerous uh, numerous colleagues that are working at Hinkley and um, we've all we've been involved in the, the delivery of the infrastructure to Hinkley now all I can say is Hinkley I think is um, is, is almost another type of beast when it comes to delivery we have a lot of similarities uh, in terms of the size, the scale, the budget, things like that. But um, Hinkley uh, seems to like doing infrastructure twice, is my understanding of the project. They've installed a complete, um, uh, how do you say, construction supporting infrastructure, and then they're going to do a complete um, permanent design infrastructure. Uh, at, at ITA, we tried very early on to install all of the very uh, deep electrical galleries and the um, drainage and water networks. And then we were able very early on to um, route as much of the temporary networks required for the construction through those uh, permanent systems. And we, we took that sort of, a, I don't say in benchmarking or, or lessons learned, we took some of this learning between Hinkley and our, ourselves on just what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, to try and try and get a better understanding of, of how their teams are performing than our ones are. So we, we've done we've done bits like that. I hope that answered your question, but feel free to drop me a message if you want to have a chat about it, Matthew. I'll be interested to talk it through. Excellent. Thank you, James, and thank you for that extended offer. Um, there's a, a couple of uh, similar questions. So it's been posed by Mike and then Michael. I don't know if Mike posted it once and then thought, you know what, I'll post it again under the name Michael and see if I get it. Um, and I know we joked about the internet connection might break during the Q&A session. Uh, but this question is, how has Brexit impacted the team dynamic or, or impacted the project as a whole? um yeah really interesting question it's still impacting the project that's for sure i, I get asked uh, well, at least once a week what's happening am i going home uh, so i think it's a, a yeah it's not been it's not been an easy time to be uh, to be british and working in france um the, the simple answer is following the brexit agreement the the uk decided to stay in um, your atom Euratom is the funding mechanism for um, ITER from the European Union. So we, as uh, the UK, are still very much contributing on very much part of the project. So there is still very much a UK involvement on ITER. 
in terms of personal situation of working out here, it's now complicated. You now need a visa to come if you're going to do any kind of um, long or technical research projects here. Um, for myself, um, it's a, there's a similar scheme as the settled status in the UK, I believe, for, for people that were here before the breakfast Brexit date. So uh, for myself, it's um, it hasn't impacted my day-to-day -day living, but it's definitely impacted our position and our recognition on the project and I'll definitely say that we've, we've as a UK entity we've lost out on some contracts due to due to Brexit and certainty on the ITA project. Excellent thank you for, for covering that question for Mike and, and Michael. Um, so Emma uh, again has brought us back to your team um, so five years in what keeps you and your team motivated on the project? The way it, is, it goes back to the breaking it down into the little, into the goals, the achievable goals that you can communicate and people can understand. So we had a, we had a big milestone um, with the infrastructure where we've broken it all down into three phases. We have the deepest underground works, um, the, the, the precipitation drainage, the electrical galleries, and then you have the shallower networks, which were all of the gas networks, the water networks, the um, you know, interconnecting, uh, um, shallower networks and then we've got the surface networks which were um, you know, outdoor lighting roads lighting you know curbs you name it and for each of those stages the, the deep shallow and, and shallower we've had milestones and achievements along the way so it's keeping that level of success and recognition in the program those milestones and then making sure you're celebrating each one it's um, otherwise it can it can feel a little bit like what's well, a six-year program you're doing the same thing day in day out but no we've got this milestone then we've got this milestone yes fantastic we've achieved that one let's set let's stop let's celebrate it recognize what went well how can we do better on the next one it's um yeah just just breaking it down and repeating those steps so you're learning, you're improving, you, you're getting more, uh, more, more as a developed team. Excellent. Thank you, James. And, and talking about the milestones and the, the duration, I, I think Andrew's made a, a good question here where he says, considering the time factor to design and construct, what allowances have been made for future new technology? Ah, mm, uh, good question. Good question. Good question. So I, I'm going to answer a little bit just in my uh, sphere of of the project. So from from the site infrastructure point of view. So the the for example the the cooling water systems that we've installed are are very much uh, future proofed for a future um, capability increase. And it's the same with all of the electrical networks, um, the, the galleries, the underground, um, big concrete tunnels that connect all the buildings are very much future proofed for um, new uh, systems being installed. For the tokamak itself, it, it's, very, it's very difficult. The tokamak is 1970s technology. Um, and the, the bit that's becoming um, more and more interesting is things like the blankets and the say the, 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 the diverter components, the part that actually acts as the heat shield between the, the plasma and the, the, the magnets, which are cryogenically cooled. That's where the clever stuff is in terms of the future proofing. So they're actually all designed to be demountable and replaceable. So at the moment they they have a I can't remember what the alloy type is there that there's actually been um, developed through Jet in the UK um, which they're installing um, to as the sort of the heat um, protection um, but it's all completely demountable so in the future if a new uh, material is developed through Jet or through another sort of tokamak or another you know a high Precision Institute, then they could be replaced on on ITA. Um, one thing I found fascinating when I first started here is to, to answer the, answer the question a bit further is there was a, there's actually a risk register um, of of parts or of materials that haven't actually been invented yet, but a need for them. So they've got the characteristics of what they need, but the material doesn't exist yet. So they they are they are thinking way ahead. Of, of how could this be approved, improved to try and hold that plasma for as long as possible. 
Excellent. Thank you, James and Andrew. I, I hope that answers your question. Um, I'm aware of the time, and James, you've been, been great answering all these questions, and I can see another 10 or 15 stacked up. I'm going to be really cheeky because there is one that I'm just going to put to you, if you if you don't mind, from Philip. Not sure. Um, I don't know where Philip is in the in the world, um, but if he's anything like me and he can hear the rain on the windows, I don't know if this is linked to the question. But he said, really interesting project. Thanks for the presentation. Can you let me know uh, why the location was selected? Um, <laughs> I don't know if he's thinking of the sun, uh, but were there any local challenges that you had to overcome? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really interesting one. So there was a, a, a huge battle to to select the location. So it was it was selected to be in Europe quite early on. And then there was a very, very big um, political wrangling between France and Spain on where it should be situated. And each country was bidding for it to be located there. And um, in the end, um, France put up the better, the better, let's say, financial incentive to base it in in um, in Cadarache. So we we were actually a joint to a, a French nuclear research facility. Um, so in terms of all the site license, all of the things was already there for the site. And what actually happened is, so France got the ITER site, but as a compensation, um, Fusion for Energy's headquarters, so the European Domestic Agency's headquarters, is now in Barcelona. So all of the hundreds of people that are employed by Fusion of Energy as a bit of a sweetener to Spain was actually, is now based in Barcelona. So there's a, it's a very, very, one, one I think on one of my slides I said about the political challenges of this project. If you, if you took all of the contracts and you took all of the nationalities and you did a, a deep dive on the value, it will, it will come out roughly equivalent to the amount of funding each country is putting into the project. And they're very careful to keep everyone happy. So every now and again, say the Americans get upset that they haven't won a contract for a while and all, all lo and behold, they win the next contract. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting how it, how it ended up being situated here. And just to answer the second part of your question, have we had any issues? Very much so. Um, we're actually in a national forest. Um, so there is a lot, a lot of challenges around the protection of the forest and you can't quite see it in this photo. But the, when engaged, when we designed the tokamak, one of the requirements was for the site to blend into the surroundings. So half of the buildings are actually in mirrored cladding. So they reflect the surrounding forest. So if you're, say, standing on um, Mont Andaleur or, or Mont Ventoux, which is not very far from here, you won't actually be able to see it. Uh, it, reflects, it reflects the forest around it. So it's, it's very cleverly designed. Excellent. Thank you, James. And, and good question as well, Philip, to, to end today's q and um, I'm going to say thank you, James, again, for giving up your time and your knowledge and also asking, answering all these questions. And I'm going to welcome Paul back just to bring this to a close. Thanks thank you. Me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks, James. I mean, that was an absolutely fascinating presentation. Even the answers at the end, you know, how it reflects the forest around it. It's absolutely brilliant. I think just reflecting back, you, you know, you're using phrases such as giant thermos flask, hottest place in the solar system, 20 billion expenditure. Yeah, had me hooked straight away. Um, sounds like a fabulous project to be involved in. Um, and like many of uh, kind of the audience, I was fascinated by the cultural aspects as well. And how we can actually use that to uh, the advantage of the project by taking the best cultures and, and blending them with the team. So I think that's fantastic. Um, yeah, it'd be good to maybe catch up a bit more when we're at Atkins. So I'd like to find out a bit more about the project. Um, otherwise, I'll yeah, say thank you to yourself for doing it, for to Robert, to uh, for hosting us, and for everybody who participated in the webinar. Um, yeah, it was a really great event. So so thanks to everybody, and have a great evening and stay safe. Thank you.